You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 116, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, it's uh, we're getting into November here, 2021, and uh, it's fall, and for me, that's the time for getting everything ready for next year, soil preparation, that sort of thing. And uh, luckily for us, uh, one last time for this year, we've got author, teacher, biochemist, master gardener, myth buster, and merchant of truth, Robert Pavels, to talk about his book, uh, Soil Science for Gardeners. Uh, we've done two episodes on this book already, and now we're doing our third and last episode. Honestly, th this book is so deep and so rich in terms of uh, information. I could have done an episode on every chapter. Um, and I could have killed two hours, I could have ate up two hours of Robert's time easily. There's just so much in there. Um, and I just tend to be, you know, it just tends to be my style anyway. Um, and, you know, I actually agonized over it. Because I could have done my whole season on this one book. <laughs> that might have been too much for some people. But man, I mean, it's so important uh, knowing about soil, right? Uh, so yeah, Robert, yeah. Rob, Robert, come on in and say hello and uh, tell everybody what's, uh, what's happened with you right now in uh, November in Ontario. Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, I can't believe this year is November 1st. And we have not had a killing frost. Neither of us. Yeah. It, it's may come this week, but I have things flowering out there. In fact, I think I'm going to do a video tomorrow and just go around and look at all the things that are still flowering. Uh, it's just unbelievable this year. Uh, it's going to be a little cool, but uh, sunny tomorrow and uh, should be a nice day still. So <laughs> you can't best. beat that. <laughs> I got the pulled zucchini out of the garden last week. You know, uh, I mean, they're they're wrapping up, but I mean, there, there's still a lot of things in there that uh, you wouldn't ordinarily see this time. Beans, green beans, <laughs> green beans. green beans. You can harvest it very late. My beets are all still in the ground, so yes. I got to do something with those. Some carrots, <laughs> I have to do something with those. Um, yeah, it's like Christmas is here, and we're we're still digging in the garden. This year is gonna ruin us for because you get like <laughs> like it's usually the case that I say oh I'll do that next week I'll procrastinate and then the season four this year the procrastination hasn't been penalized you know in any way like uh, the procrastination has been completely rewarded yeah you know? so right. uh, it's a bad habits um, so yeah it, we've covered up to I don't know what it is like maybe chapter seven or so uh, chapter chapter eight I think is what we. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't read the book. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I just write them, he says. Uh, we've covered up to chapter eight in your book, and we're not going to, you know, give a full treatment to what's left of the book, but I've sort of done a, a little uh, smattering, a sampling of, of, of the remaining chapters and stuff I thought people might want to know. And, you know, sure, uh, you know, buy the book, read it. There's a lot we're going to, a lot we're not going to talk about that's in there. Um, but yeah, I thought the remainder of the book is about identifying, identifying soil problems and deciding what to do about them. That's, you know, oversimplification, but that's about it. Um, and a lot of, uh, and really this book, you know, if you think about it, uh, Robert, like your, your first two gardening books are like gardening myths, one gardening myths two, and they're in a sense, they're like what not to do. I mean, you do in the book, you say, don't do this, do that. Like you, you do sort of do that, but they're more like, you know, look, everybody's saying this, that's not a good thing. And by the way, maybe you should try this. This is more like do this, but there is still the myths in there because it's part of the conversation. You know, you can hear people in your head saying, do this, do that. And you're like, no, don't do this, don't do that. This book is really like, the, it's full circle in a sense, right? Coming all the different soil myths and garden myths. And you're sort of putting that into... Uh, into context and, and finishing up saying this is what you should do right here's some solutions so I think that's really important for gardeners because when they go to other places to get information like anything online or other books uh, there's a, a big part of that information is it's just not true it's not good advice <laughs> right so we have to keep letting people know that some of this and and some of this has been around for like many many years and everybody believes that it, it's just not the right advice no. so we have to keep hammering on those things that are wrong too yes yeah. so i guess uh speaking to that and I, I don't know if this is good advice or bad advice but um in your sort of first chapter about uh you know identifying soil problems 
um, you sort of go against you go against the grain in your book, and you you don't yeah. recommend soil tests. I mean, I don't think you're against them, but um, you, you sort of have a qualified statement about soil tests, um, which is a, a typical thing uh, any sort of garden guru will say is get your soil tested, get, get your soil tested. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Where, where were you coming from when you were when you're saying that? Yeah, you're right. I mean, most people will tell you get your soil tested, and I'm a master gardener, and that's what we tell everybody get your soil tested. So I was at one of these uh, provincial master gardener groups. So we had like 100 master gardeners in the room. And I asked the question, how many have you, how many of you have actually tested your soil? And it was like two hands go up. Okay. <laughs> so we tell everyone to test their soil, but we don't do it ourselves. Right? Yeah. So here's the way I approach this. I, I think there's two key questions that we have to ask. Uh, the first one is, what are you going to do with the information? Okay, so now you get this report and it says, you know, you're high in potassium and you're low in phosphate and so on. And you have to go out and you have to find the right kind of fertilizer to give you the nutrients you need. Well, I can almost guarantee you can't find that. So you actually have to go out and buy several different kinds of fertilizers and start mixing them together and then putting the right amounts into your soil. Now, I know most gardeners, they don't do that. They get to the garden center, they'll put their piece of paper and they'll say, I need, I need this here. And the guy says, well, I don't sell that. But here's this bag of 10, 10, 10. And you say, OK, I'll take that. <laughs> right. So the first question to ask yourself is, are you really going to follow the advice on the test results? If you're simply going to go to the garden center and buy a bag of fertilizer and bring it home and use it, then don't spend the money on the test. Right. The other thing is if you're going to go and buy some manure and some compost, that doesn't do it either. That's not going to match your test. So those are good things to do. I'm not against doing those things, but then skip the test because you're not really following it. Right. And I don't meet a lot of gardeners who could actually figure out which fertilizers to buy to meet that test. So that, that's the first problem I have. Uh, the second problem I have is that the one nutrient that we know is most likely deficient in our garden is nitrogen. Okay, if anything's deficient, it's nitrogen. In fact, gardeners can pretty much assume that nitrogen is too low. Soil tests don't measure nitrogen. <laughs> okay, so the thing you need to know most, you will not be told by a soil test. I didn't know that. So, so why don't they do that? Just because it's so well, it's, it's so mobile, it's so transitive sort of thing? Yeah, nitrogen changes really quickly, right? So yeah. on Monday, I go out and get my soil and I take it down to the lab. Tuesday, it rains. Well, a week from now, I get my results. It's completely different, right? Nitrogen changes on a daily, hourly basis. So agriculture does test for nitrogen, but they go and they take their sample and they freeze it and they keep it frozen, take the lab frozen, and then it goes through a special process, which costs a lot more money. Gardeners don't do that. <laughs> so for the average test, you will not get your nitrogen value, which means you don't know how much nitrogen to put on your soil, but you do know that's the one that your garden probably needs. So now what do you do when you go to the garden center to buy fertilizer? How much nitrogen do you buy? How, how much do you put on your garden? You have no idea. Well, if that's the most important part, I mean, the soil test is kind of missing the boat, right? And there's probably a, a third reason, and that is that if, if you put manure and compost and so on into your garden and, and you keep adding organic matter into the garden, you're probably not deficient in these other things. So what I recommend gardeners do is it's plant stuff, grow stuff. If it grows reasonably well, you can be pretty sure you're not deficient in a nutrient, at least no major deficiency, right? If you grow things and they don't grow well, well, then maybe get a soil test done because now you have a problem that you have to figure out. And by the way, another myth that uh, I see all the time on the internet is, well, look at your leaves and if, if they're this color or, or if they're, you know, have some a yellow on them that's this deficiency and so on. And there's little charts. Okay, that doesn't work. You cannot tell your deficiency by looking at your leaves. That's complete math. They're very nice memes and they make everybody feel good, um, but they don't work. So one thing I have in my book, 
uh, is uh, int um, intravenal chlorosis, which is uh, yellow between the veins, but the veins are still green. Okay, that's very common on, on plants. Everybody says, oh, that, that's an iron deficiency. And it could be, but in the book, I'll list something like a dozen other things it could also be. I remember that and, table. And the gardener cannot tell which one of those it is. So if it's not growing right, get a soil test. But if you plant a bunch of stuff and they're growing okay, why bother? <laughs> yeah. now, I've been gardening for, I don't know, 40 years. Um, no, maybe not quite that much, but almost 40 years. Um, I've never got a soil test done until about five years ago. And I did it mostly to make a video because I want to see what the results were. <laughs> right. So yes. all those time, I never used the soil test. My parents never used the soil test. We just grow stuff. Yeah. yeah. That was another so, thing you said too in the chapter about, you know, sometimes the test is, is relative to what you're trying to grow. Um, yeah. I actually, I, I think not very often. Not very often. So we do have a pH of soil and uh, we have plants that need acidic soil. And then we have a bunch of plants that uh, can take pretty much anything up to alkaline soil. And um, if people in your area don't grow, you know, azaleas, rhododendrons, and blueberries, then your soil is not acidic. Okay. And I know in the Gulf area, nobody can grow those plants. So that tells me right away, we're not acidic here. Because yeah. those plants definitely need that. And if you find yourself, uh, you know, an old time gardener who's been around the block a few times, just ask them, can you grow rhododendrons? And if he looks at you and says, well, of course not, they don't grow here. You know, you're not ascetic. Right. Okay. So that's close enough. Right. You don't need to be any closer. So now the other thing that's promoted a lot is these home uh, test kits that you get from nurseries. Yes. And I made a couple of videos comparing them to the lab tests. And that, that's why I got my soil tested. And quite honestly, the accuracy is, is pretty bad on those. Really? And they're cheap, very inexpensive, um, but the results aren't very reliable. Okay, so I, I don't recommend those kits. If you do care and want to know the results, get a proper lab to do the analysis. That's, right. You know, it's going to cost you in Canada, it's going to cost you $30, $40. In the US, probably $15. Um, but if you need the results, then get, get a proper lab test done. All right. Well, this segues perfectly to, because in each of your, well, in, in the, I think that chapter of the next one, you you talk about different kinds of tests, different appro approaches, but in every one of those little sections, you have a little little gray box that says like, here's a neat little sort of uh, low budget uh, home gardener sort of test you can do that'll give you you know an idea of what's going on in your soil. So uh, why don't you talk about a few of those? I think I uh, in the email I sent you, I listed yeah. about five, but any, anything else you want to add there is fine. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, most of these soil properties can be tested by a professional lab, but gardeners don't do it because it's, it's just too expensive. So when I wrote the book, I looked for tests that you could do at home that would give you some way to evaluate these characteristics. And one of the ones I suggest everybody do is to measure their texture. Now, soil texture, if you think about texture, it's, it's how it feels. And the way I remember what that texture word means is that if it's sandy, it will feel very gritty. If you have a lot of clay, it feels very smooth because the clay is very small. And the first time you do it, you might not you know, notice a difference. But if you go and touch some soils, very quickly you learn to tell the difference a little bit, you know. Uh, a much better way is to take some of that soil, put it in a jar with some water, shake it up, and the sand is big and heavy. So within a minute, it all settles. And then you just put a line on, on the jar to show how much sand you had. You mean put, you wait, put it with more water than you have soil sort of thing. Yeah, and, and the, the amounts don't really matter, right? So you're, you're let's say one third soil, two thirds water, but as long as you have more water, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Right? And a good clear jar works well for this. Um, so then we wait for an hour and the silt is smaller than sand. So it settles next and it takes about an hour for the silt to settle. 
and then you do another line and then clay is very very tiny so we have to wait 24 hours for it to settle and sometimes it doesn't even settle so you can throw in a few salt crystals like table salt will work um so we want that to sell so we wait the 24 hours put another line and then based on how far the lines are apart you can calculate your texture and right. i do a video to that works you through all the calculations using a ruler and doing some basic math sort of thing yeah, yeah you do you measure the height of each line and then you go over to your texture chart and you look it up and it, it's <laughs> relatively simple and it's quite accurate actually i mean it's not as good as a lab but it's good enough for gardeners right so i know in my garden i have about 40 percent clay right and about 20 percent sand Right. And the rest of the silt. So now I know the type of soil I have, and that tells me something about how I, I treat that soil. So people with clay soil, it, it means that it, they tend to stay wet. Uh, they compact easily. Uh, they're nutritious. So people hate digging in clay and people with clay soil go, oh God, I hate this stuff because it's heavy, it's hard to dig, it clumps, it gets all over your shoes and so on. But the nice thing about clay soil, is it's got lots of nutrients in there because the clay holds the nutrients. At the other end of the spectrum, we have people with sand and you know that's easy to dig in, but it dries really quick and it doesn't hold any nutrients. So the people with sand are constantly throwing in fertilizer or compost, trying to get enough nutrients in there to grow things. And, and that's a problem as well, right? But figure out your texture is actually quite simple. And, and you can do that this time of year. You don't have to do this in summer. It doesn't matter when you do it, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you can, the ground's not so frozen, you can't dig, you, you can run that test. Uh, what was the other one? Oh, the, the microbes. So... Uh, I talk a lot in the book about the importance of microbes to healthy soil. And many people are starting to understand that, but quite honestly, most people don't know why they're that important. But they do know we need microbes and microbes are good in the soil. How many do you have? Well, it turns out that that's a really hard question to answer for a gardener. And uh, there just isn't any good way of doing that. Now there's a, a relatively simple way, and that is to count earthworms. So there's actually a procedure where you, you dig like a one by one foot square, one foot deep, dig all that soil out, and you actually count the number of earthworms. And that tells you how many microbes you have. And the reason is that uh, um, earthworms actually eat microbes. They, they don't like plant material. Okay? They eat the plant material because it's coated in microbes. So you know they're eating a leaf to get the microbes, they don't really want to eat leaves. Right. So the more earthworms you have, the more microbes you have. Right. Um, right. So that gives you a rough idea. The other way that I found a couple of years ago, which I, I just thought was, was so funny that the first time I read it, I thought, oh, this, this, this has got to be a joke, but it actually turns out to work pretty well. And that is the, the whitey tidy test. <laughs> so you go out and get yourself some good men's white cotton underwear. Okay. Well, cotton is an organic matter and microbes digest organic matter. So you take this underwear, you weigh it, you bury it for what, five weeks? How deep and should you bury it? It doesn't really matter, but put it where the roots are. So I'd say like six inches deep okay. kind of thing. You want to measure the microbes near the surface. All right. Um, now you could actually do an experiment where you have several and you do them at different depths. Yeah, that'd be cool. But what you'll find is most of the microbes are in the top six inches. And then yeah. as you go deeper and deeper, you'll have fewer and fewer microbes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you wait the, you, you wait the five weeks, you dig it up and have a look at it. And, and you can weigh it again if you wanna calculate it accurately. Um, now, if most of the, the underwear is gone, then you got really good soil and you've got lots of microbes, right? So this test works better if you're comparing two areas. So you, you put two different underwear in there or, or you do it from year to year to see if your improvement methods are actually working, right? Does underwear this year degrade faster than it did three years ago? And, and you know you're, you're progressing in the right direction. Yes. Now, there, there's a caveat about this, of course. Um, you know, if, if you're a lady gardener, okay, these thongs that you wear 
<laughs> I mean, there just there just isn't enough material there to get good numbers. So you want a good good wide pair of underwear. <laughs> the old granny ones. <laughs> I mean, it sounds really hokey, but it's actually used in some schools as a training exercise, and it does actually work. You you right. get a a qualitative analysis of your soil. Yeah. And uh, and it's a fun fun thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. It's a good good indirect measure. Yeah. Um, so let us. What are some other things you can do? Well, drainage is is another one that uh, plagues a lot of people. And so what you do is you you dig a hole uh, about a foot by a foot, and it can be round. It doesn't have to be square. A foot deep. Take that soil out. Fill it with water and let the water run away. Um, that may take a while, depending on your soil. But we want that soil around that hole to be fully saturated. And the easiest way to do is you do this one day and you come back the next day and, and hopefully the, the, the hole is, is dry. If not, you get terrible drainage. <laughs> we come back the next day, the soil is all wet, the hole is empty, and now you fill it a second time and you measure it with a ruler. Okay, So you might have a 10-inch hole and you say, okay, I got 10 inches of water. And then you wait an hour and measure it again, and wait another hour and measure it again. And what you want to calculate is how quickly that water runs away. Yeah. Okay? So if, if you end up with something between one and three inches per hour, that's good soil. It's, it's draining well. If, after, if we have a number that's less than one inch, which means it's, it's just not going away, then you have poor drainage. But the other end of this, the range is also important. So if you're faster than three inches, that means you have too much drainage. Right? Right. You're probably in a sandy soil and the water's running away. That's not good for plants either because it means they're going to be dry a large amount of the time. Yeah, yeah. Or you have to do a lot of watering, right? Yeah. So you want to be in that one to three inch range. And if you're outside of that, then you have issues. And now we find a way to kind of solve those problems and, and try and improve that drainage. Right, right, right. Uh, but that's a test that anybody can do. It's, it's, it's pretty accurate and quite easy to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other one is compaction. Uh, compaction is terrible for soil, it's terrible for microbes, and it's terrible for plants. So we don't want compaction <laughs> anywhere. And compaction can be measured with, uh, uh, what is it called, a, a, a penetrometer to see how deep it is. But uh, those are a couple hundred dollars. You don't really need one of those. You can just use a wire. So you get a stiff wire and you literally push it into the ground. Like a coat hanger sort of thing? A coat hanger, yeah. Straighten the coat hanger, push it in the ground and see how far you can push in the ground before it starts to bend. Okay, so you want a wire that's, that's reasonably stiff. Right? You don't right. want a really skinny thing, but a coat hanger would work well. Right. Now, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot, but if you can get it down a foot before it bends, then you have great soil. Wow. Okay? Uh, where it's really useful is to compare two areas. So if you look at your garden, the areas that are probably the least compacted are along your fence lines because nobody walks there. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Um, or if you're near a field where you know the soil is like yours, but there's, there's an empty field next door that nobody touches in a place like that. So you want to measure a couple places and you do a comparison. You know, what is your flower bed like compared to your lawn, for instance? How do those two compare to the fence line? And we assume the fence line is, is uncompacted soil because nobody walks there. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we can see what that difference is and we can see the compaction and we can also measure it over time. So you measure it this year and you do it again next year and see if the things you're doing in your garden are actually improving compaction or maybe they're making them worse. Right. right. Uh, so there's a number of things that that you can do. They're fairly simple and it gives you a good input in your Con soil conditions. I like all these tests because they they don't cost anything. They're very logical. Like it's very pragmatic. So uh, it's right up my alley. I think I might do uh, do some of these this summer just for fun and maybe make a video of it. Uh, yeah. Also, there's parts of my garden that, you know, I got some newer beds that just don't perform as well as some of the other ones. I mean, the soil doesn't look as dark and as rich, but that yeah. doesn't always mean everything. Um, but uh, I'd be curious to see like, 
that that soil texture, I, I would guess they have less organic matter in them. Um, you know, I would, I would guess, you know, I mean, all my soil, the base is clay, it's a lot of clay. Um, but I've learned from reading your book and others that uh, don't don't be hating on clay, it's good stuff. Um, you know, learn, learn to love your clay. Um, and I get good results, so it can't be all that bad. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see the, the good garden that is everything grows great with the I got two new I got two of the new newer beds that I created a couple of years ago. They just always perform poorly. Um, everything I grow in them doesn't grow well. It, it grows not as like it's just smaller and crappier than everything. Um, so it, you know, there's plenty range of possible reasons, right? But uh, anyway, um, okay. So uh, the next uh, section in your book, you're talking about um, different gardening techniques and how they affect the soil. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Tilling, mulching, cover crops, raised beds, crop rotation, plant, uh, companion planting. Sure, sure. So uh, it, it's interesting to me that a lot of farmers, people in agriculture, know about no-till gardening or no-till farming, or what a lot of them do is, is a low-till farming, right? They can't get away from, and do no-tilling, but they, they try to do as little as possible. Mm. And, uh, and it depends on the crops you have, and it depends on the kind of soil you have, and a bunch of other things. But this has been around in agriculture for, for many, many years. And it's just now uh, becoming a, a thing with gardeners. I mean, gardeners aren't aware of this, right? So the best way to treat your garden is never till it. Mm -hmm. Whereas historically, people have these little rototillers and they go and they, they rototill their gardens every spring. And the reason they do that is because they wanna fluff it up. They know that seeds germinate easier in this fluffy soil. Right? And, and it's true, okay? Um, they also do it to get rid of weeds, right? They go out in the spring, the weeds are starting to sprout and they rototill it and the day after, geez, that's all so nice, no weed in sight. Yes. But there, there are several problems with this. As far as weeds go, what you're actually doing is turning the soil and you're bringing weed seeds that are now buried to the surface so they can sprout. Mm -hmm. So tilling actually gets more weeds than not tilling, okay? But more important to that is that you're destroying soil structure, okay? When you till, you get fluffy soil for a short period of time, but within a month, that soil is now back to where it was before. And in fact, it's worse off because you've destroyed that structure. Soil has a three-dimensional type of structure and it's called aggregation. And uh, I, I recommend every gardener go out into the woods or into a field that hasn't been touched for years and play in the soil. And you'll see how that soil is nice and soft and friable. And in my woods, I can actually dig with my hands. I don't yeah. even need a shovel. Yeah. But when I dig that up, I see these large pieces of soil. These are the aggregates. And that's what we want in soil. We want these three-dimensional structure forming. That's when you've got lots of microbes, you've got plants that have no problem growing roots in it. It's got lots of air in there for the plant roots. Tilling destroys aggregation. So tilling actually makes your soil worse. Okay? Now, one of the things I, I hear about and read all the time by the organic, pro-organic people, they say, well, you know, agriculture is harming the soil because they're taking all these synthetic fertilizers and spreading them on the soil. And that actually isn't true. The problem with modern agriculture is they till. They got big equipment that's running over it to compact things, and they bring tillers along to till it. And that constant tilling does a number of things. It adds air to the soil which speeds up the decomposition of organic matter. So you lose organic matter. When you lose organic matter, you also lose all the microbes. And then you end up with crappy soil, right? right. So we need to reverse that. And one of the ways you do that is don't till. Don't dig in your garden unless it's necessary. Just leave it, hmm. right? So uh, in my vegetable garden, and, and I'm sure you do this too, you, you do as little in that garden as you can. Yeah. So I go out in the spring and I'm planting some pea seeds. That'd be one of the first things I do next spring. 
I, I will rake the straw over that's sitting there, maybe a couple of weeks before I plant, just to let the soil warm up. And then I bring along a rake and I, I make a little furrow, put my seeds in and cover them up. I don't, even, no I don't even do that. I just push them in with my thumb. I jam them in. You know, <laughs> I mean, I move the stuff aside, like you said, but I don't even make a furrow. I literally drive the same with beans. I drive them into the ground with my thumb. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> no digging, no, digging <laughs> no, no tilling, no nothing, right? Yeah. We, we don't want to touch that soil because we're destroying it. And, and by leaving it alone, all that organic matter stays in there and it just gets better and better. And if you do this for a few years, it, you're right. You can just push seeds in. You don't, you don't have to do anything. Um, I guess I'm just a little neater than you. I like my straight row. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, where I put my peas, I probably don't even have to do it anymore. It's just I've been doing it for so many oh, years. That's your ritual. And the, yeah, it's, exactly. But the key is stop digging in your soil. Don't yes. walk where you plant, right? Because you're compacting it. And don't dig it. Right. I, I often think that we're, I mean, I, I grew up with the tilling model and I think we almost have a, an addiction to the, the, the feel and the look of tilled soil. Yeah. And so uh, my theory is that uh, you grow potatoes to get that out of your system because you're going to turn your soil over when you, when you dig out your potatoes. Yeah. So that way you can get, you know, you know, at least in one of your beds, you can dig the hell out of the soil once you can get that. You know, and you can level it out with your rake and it's all black. And, oh, God, you know, I just love <laughs> so you get to enjoy, you know, just revel in the digging and the, and the tilling and the moving everything around, at least in one bed or you know, I grow probably five or six beds worth of potatoes every year. But it's a good way to get it out of your system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, you know, for gardeners, stop that. Leave your beds <laughs> alone. Right. Yeah. Uh, same in your ornamental beds. The same thing. I mean, just just leave stuff. Right. Leave it alone. Don't dig. Um, the only dime I dig in my garden is if I'm moving something and then I do as little of that digging as, as I can. So but the other thing we, we both do a lot of is mulching. Right. So in my yes. vegetable garden, I mulch with straw and in my ornamental beds, I use, try to use wood chips. Yeah. And um, we want to keep that soil covered. Right, we keep it cooler. Um, the um, decomposition of the organic matter slows down a little bit that way. The the mulch is slowly decomposing and adding nutrients to our soil. Um, we don't have a problem with crusting on the soil. Right, that's another big problem with particularly with vegetable gardeners. They they get crusting and then they come along with their hoe every week and break up the crust. What right. causes the crusting? I've never had that problem because I cover cover everything. But I remember when I was growing up, I remember seeing it on our gardens. So yeah. What causes that? Well, the, the crusting is is a combination of things. So first of all, if you do a lot of tilling, you the, the surface gets covered in very small particles instead of these aggregates. So you have very tiny particles. And the crust is actually caused by the pressure of raindrops, mm. which makes no sense at all. But the raindrops are actually pretty powerful. So they come down and they bang on that soil right. and they, they basically pulverize that surface. And then once the water drains away, it forms that crust. So the crust is really very, very fine particles of soil that's been pounded by rain. Like little bullets, I guess. No, little bullets, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you mulch, you don't, you don't get that, right? It, it doesn't dry out so much. Um, the rain doesn't hit the soil. No. Uh, all those problems go away, right? Yes. So uh, for me, mulching is is really critical. Yes. And uh, you know, I I almost never weed in my vegetable garden. I mean, yeah. the odd weed comes up, but um, usually right beside you know a, a beet or something where the mulch isn't close enough to the beet. But that's right. In my pathways and so on, I I don't weed. I, I just mulch. No, oh, that's right. I only weed if I've been negligent in my mulching. Yeah. <laughs> Which happens that's once right. in a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So huge important. So we also have things like cover crops. So cover crops is something I don't do. Uh, the colder your climate, the harder it is to do cover crops. That's what I find. So I, I'm not com convinced it's worthwhile doing in my garden. Because by the time I harvest my last things and, and the ground's frozen is 
six weeks kind of thing, right? Yeah. Or maybe two months. Not much is going to grow there. But I think if the climate's a little warmer, and probably if you pick the right things, cover crops will work. So the idea of a cover yeah. crop is that you plant something that grows quick, and then you, you either kill it or you let it die off in the winter time. So a good cover crop is one that you plant in the fall. It, it, it's germinates right away when it's still warm. So we, we, you try to do that like in August or something, early September, and it grows like crazy. And then the winter kills it and it's gone for the springtime. Yeah. Yeah. The other option is to do uh, uh, um, perennials. The problem with perennials is that they're now in your garden next spring. So you, you kind of have to either dig them up or you have to plant in them or you have to use a herbicide to kill them which to me doesn't make any sense so i i you know i don't see using perennials again in in very warm climates where you've got long seasons they might make sense so you you grow something for three four months and then you you grow a cover crop for three or four months right that yes. probably works really well they they work they add organic matter to the soil the roots go into the soil which tends to loosen it um, so they're a great idea um, if, if you can get them to grow long enough. That's... I've, I've often thought of doing it in a potato bed because sometimes mm -hmm. you can harvest the potatoes in like July or really early August. And I found like anything I want to grow, I have to plant it by like the, the first week of August. Even that might be too late because everything starts to come to a screeching halt sometimes in September um so if i could find like something that grows really and i also don't want to have to dig it in so i want something that i know will die in my winter because i don't want to yeah. do any work and but it, it would have to be planted like the last week of july or the first week of august and it'd have to grow crazy crazy fast you know i mean there are things that'll do that i suppose but yeah yeah, yeah i always thought that you could probably do it like between your rows maybe plant your seeds before the crops actually harvested so by that time, the cover crop, you know, by the time you harvest, the cover crop is already several inches tall, yeah. but you haven't yeah. really had any competition yet. So I'm sure there's ways of doing it. Yeah, um, that makes sense. I've just been too lazy to, to really do it. <laughs> I was like, I pick my potatoes and I can just throw a bag of leaves on it. Nah, done. You know, it's just all over with. Or, or sometimes I'll even plant uh, a spinach in those beds because I want to eat spinach in uh, in, 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 Oct in October, right? Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. yeah. Um, raised beds is an interesting topic. Um, I think raised beds are great. In fact, the first garden I ever made was a raised bed. But in those days, we didn't put walls around them. Okay, We didn't go out and buy expensive lumber or bricks <laughs> or anything else. We just went out and we, we took the path, the soil in the pathways and dug down six inches and moved that onto where the gardens are. And um, that raised them up a few inches, and that was a raised bed, right? And that idea works really well. The other idea in there is the fact that you have a bed that's, you know, three, four feet wide, and you never walk in it. You, you do all the cultivation and harvesting from the sides. And that's great because now we don't have compaction, right? So the soil yes. is healthier in there. So that makes perfect sense. And I don't have a problem with someone going out and buying two by six and making raised beds a little bit and, and makes a little neater. What, what I find really strange is these people as they go out and make raised beds that are four feet tall, yes. right? They go out and buy all this lumber, they make them, and then they get online and they go, well, how do I fill this thing? I just got the price of soil. I can't afford it all, right? I need six cubic yards for one uh, four by eight garden or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then, of course, they... They come back and say, well, it, 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 you know, it's, it's sort of easier to dig in there. I don't have to bend over. Now, to be fair, there, people with mobility issues, I think those gardens are, are great, right? But uh, one thing I did very informally last year is I, I just kind of tracked how much time I actually spend bent over in one of my beds. So this was a bed where I had carrots and beets and so on. Um, you know, you, you rake a little bit in the spring you pull the straw away you make it a bit especially for carrots because the seeds are a little tricky to germinate so you want a flat bed so you rake a little bit you know but actually you're standing up with the rake so you're not even bent over if you if you mulch you don't weed much right harvesting you have to bend over and seeding you have to bend over 
But I would say in, in most small beds, I, I wouldn't spend more than two hours a year. Yep, that's that would be my estimate. Two hours and that's a year. spread over six months. Yes, right? you can, and people you can. are saying, "Well, I, I'm I don't want to bend over." Well, you know, if you can't bend over for two hours and six months, then maybe you should be gardening. <laughs> yeah, you can do ten, 10 minutes a day for one week, and you're half done. You know, sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think people have this vision of of uh, spending a lot of time bent over, and it it really isn't there in a small backyard garden right it's not like we have a quarter acre and we got long rows that we have to weed and so on and i think the other thing is maybe they've been reading books and information from people who don't know how to garden too well but if you yes. do what we're doing right don't don't till don't uh, mulch well so you eliminate all the weeds and, and so on the amount of time it takes to garden is actually pretty small that's right so i'm kind of against these these big beds and um the, the other reason is that some people then come along and say, well, I'm going to fill it with some really good stuff. So I'll fill it with compost, for instance, or I throw in perlite and vermiculite and then a bunch of other things, right? Um, you know, all these vegetables grow really well in soil and the soil you have in your garden is probably pretty good, except it doesn't have enough organic matter in there. And why not just use what you have? right? Rather yeah. than making these big beds. So I'm for raised beds because it keeps people off the soil, but I'm not for tall beds. No, I think they should, in some very special cases. I often think they should change the terminology to slightly raised designated gardening spaces. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but that's, that's all. I, I mean, my beds are six inches high and actually, the, I mean, that's just the wood. The soil, mm -hmm. it might just be three inches above grade at the most. Sometimes it's and many of them, even though I've got a two by six, the soil is at grade or just slightly above grade. And most of what that border is doing is keeping my leaves and mulch from blowing all over the damn place in our crazy hurricane winds here. Um, it yeah. just sort of contains it, right? So uh, I've noticed the same thing. Even people I talk to at work, they build these monuments um, and then they got like, you know, a cucumber plant with one cucumber that's the size of my thumb. They don't know what the hell's going on. All the water's going out of their garden. It's can't hold water because all the water's in the ground and they're like, they're three feet above the ground. They filled it with God knows what, you know, filled it with peat moss or something like that. You know, and, yeah, they're, um, yeah. Yeah. So it's raised beds. <laughs> um, crop rotation and companion planting. Two of my favorite topics that I've, I've written quite a bit on in my, my Garden Myths blog, too, about both of those topics. Yes. The, the short answer is neither of them really work. So uh, crop rotation is a concept that works great in agriculture. Large I, scale. I have 50 acres over here and 50 acres over here, and I swap crops once in a while. That works, and uh, it, the science is really solid on that. You know, if I was garden doing vegetable gardening on an acre site, maybe rotation works a little bit there too. But when we're talking about the normal backyard garden, so I'm going to grow tomatoes here this year, and then I'm going to move them 20 feet over here for next year, that makes no difference whatsoever. Except in, in one case that I've been able to find, and that's if you have uh, nematode problems. Because right. nematodes are very tiny worms, they're almost microscopic, and they can't move very fast, right? So 20 feet for them may take them five years to get there, yeah, yeah. right? So if you have a nematode root problem, a backyard might work. For everything else, it doesn't work. All these flying insects, one of the flying insects I, I, I looked at when I wrote the article was um, this caterpillar that's found in the Northeast US. And it migrates down where the monarchs go every year. Okay, so but it can't go four feet. Yeah, <laughs> it leaves here, flies to Mexico for the winter, flies all the way back, and you've moved your your crop over by twenty feet, hoping it won't find it. I know, or just a few. I mean, I I, I rotate my crops because it's 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 no harder to do than to not do it. I mean, I'm just I'm it's in bed here, bed here. I just move everything over one bed, so it's 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 not hard to do. It doesn't really it's no harder to do than to not do it. Um, and there's something about it that seems like it's, it seems logical to me, but it's not, it's not uh, a challenge to do. Yeah. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, you're right, especially on a really small scale like that. What about a certain case though? Like, so this year in one of, in my kale bed, uh, I had two, I had a four by eight bed of kale and I had two different varieties of kale. Uh, a, a kale that's much like the ones you buy in the grocery store, the curly leafy kale. And another one that's like a Siberian kale, like a red Russian type thing. Almost all the red Russian kale were destroyed by something, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Now you better bet I'm not growing one brassica in that bed next year. I, I don't know if that's well, well advised, but I'm not even going to grow brassicas in the adjacent bed. I'm going to move them out of there for a while. I don't know what the hell happened there. It wasn't, um, I mean, I have the, the white, you know, the small white, you know, that's that, that uh, little white butterfly white that has yeah. this camouflage caterpillar. They're everywhere. And, you know, it's prop rotation will not protect you from that. They're flying. Right? They can go anywhere. But something rotted the, it just got into the center of that and just destroyed it. And it hmm. didn't bother the other kale, which is really weird. Um, but I think it would be unwise to grow kale in that bed next year. There's something in the ground. Well, I could the, be wrong. The, but. the trick with that, though, is to understand what it was that yeah. did the damage. I don't know right? what it was. I just. <laughs> so uh, moving it to another bed is only going to work if that organism is spending the winter in that bed. Yes. And then in the spring, when it hatches out, it's not able to get to the other beds. So if it's any kind of flying insect, it's going to find your kale no matter where you put it. Well, let's see. The, I got another kale that's about 20 feet away. It was fought. Again, it's that other species. It's, right? it's, it's this, the, the two species. The one kale, the one that was attacked, is the tastier one. And of course, the thing, whatever it was, got at that, right? Uh, yeah. I don't know what it was. But anyway, yeah, you're, you're right. If it's a flying, I mean, I, I basically took the thing out, dug the roots out, and I threw it in the woods as far as I could get it, hoping that whatever babies were in the roots were going to be exposed to the elements. And, you know, but. Uh, uh, See, the, anyway. there are some cases where, where uh, companion planting will work. So in this case, for instance, you have two kales and whatever it is goes after one of them. So. In your case, you might plant both varieties again next year to make sure that the pest only goes after one of them. But it's going after the one I was going after the one I like. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> you, it doesn't work quite that well. But no. at least you got you got to eat the one, right? Yeah, you know. So there are cases where companion planting does work. Um, the reason I'm against companion planting mostly is that most of the information that's available online. Oh, it's all woo-woo, yeah. It, it doesn't work. Like no yeah, one's yeah. studied any of those things. Oh, yeah. um, in fact, there was a, a recent book that came out on companion planting. And it's, it's something, uh, the, the subtitle is something like the science of companion planting. So I thought, well, okay, I, I gotta read this book. So I actually got a copy of it to review on my site. Oh, no. And I went and I picked, um, three things. In fact, the, the way I picked those was that the author had mentioned these three on a talk show oh. as three really good examples of science proven companion planting. So I said, okay, so I'll get those. I look at the references they have. There are no references. There's no scientific study to support those three. And the author was unable to provide any. Okay. Then I went off online and looked for scientific studies. I couldn't find them either. And then for some reason I did a fourth one. I'm not quite sure why, but I looked at the fourth one too. The, there just is not enough information out there. So I'm sure there are some combinations that are worth doing and, and I'm slowly looking at some of these. So garlic and, and, and other onions actually do deter pests on some crops. Hmm. So it's actually not a bad idea to put garlic in between other things in the hopes that they will keep some pests away. But common things like marigolds, for instance, uh, don't work for most of the pests that they're recommended. No, I, I, th I used to, I used to grow marigolds with stuff because I, like, I just heard someone say, "Oh, marigolds prevent pests." That's all I'd heard, mm -hmm. and so I planted some marigolds with my kale, and I had great kale. So I said, "Hey, the marigolds," and it's just classic type one error, post hoc ergo propter hoc, you know, just the 
logical fallacy. I did this thing, everything works. So that thing caused the things working good. Right. And it, it's just, just a coincidence, you know, like the, it just, it just so happened that there was marigolds there and other things growing well. If the marigolds hadn't been there, everything would have been fine anyway in that particular case, right? Because once I read about marigolds, they don't do anything for, I can't remember what the plant was, but they don't do anything. There's a specific instance where marigolds can, can yeah. in a certain order, in a certain way, you, know, you explain it in your book. Um, yeah, so, sound yeah, so so marigolds actually will stop uh, the root nematodes, which are very destructive for things like uh, carrots, but it only works in really hot climates like Florida. Uh, yes. Because you have to grow the marigolds in the same place you're going to grow the carrots. So you first have to do a crop of marigolds and the nematodes will go into the marigold roots. And then you, you pull those out and then plant your crop before the nematodes come back. Oh, so they don't poison them. They just, they're just in them. They're just in them. So you oh. actually need, but you need to plant two crops one after the other, which yes, is, only works in hot climates. Yes. <laughs> right? And putting the marigolds beside the root crop doesn't work it actually has to be in the same exact soil that you're going to grow carrots later on in the year mm. right? and it has to be the right kind of marigolds only some species of marigolds work which of course no, none of these popular websites and so on tell you right, right. Uh, so there are cases where companion planting works but the majority of things that gardeners read about either don't work or there's no scientific support for it right Oh, right. Uh, all right. So I think that's, I think we covered that one. Um, next, uh, there's just a couple more topics here. Um, so you were talking as a, I think it's a the title of the chapter is a, you know, chemical, solving chemical issues, which, you know, a lot of uh, organic gardeners think, oh, chemicals, that's bad, but everything's chemicals. I'm a bag of chemicals. You're a bag of chemicals. And we're talking through a bunch of chemical things to make this video. Um, and everything in your garden is chemicals to some extent. So that's why it was a great title for the chapter. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, what was it called again? Uh, solving chemical issues. So there was a comment or like a whole discussion you had in the chapter about uh, fertilization and why we shouldn't think of it as feeding the plants. And I, you made a really good point and I like the argument you made. So why don't you share that with the viewers? Right. So I, I think this is one of the, the biggest myths about gardening. You know, we talk about feeding plants. Uh, if you go to the nursery, for instance, you can buy tomato fertilizer. Food. Plant food. food for the tomatoes. Yes. Right. This, is, this is what tomatoes eat. So we buy tomato fertilizer. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I did something interesting, and you can do it, and your readers and listeners can do it just as well. Go to the internet and Google tomato fertilizer, and, you, and you'll get a whole, and, and I look at the, the pictures, not the text part. So I'm, I'm looking for pictures of tomato fertilizer, and I get a whole page of these different products. Everyone has a different NPK value. Mm. Okay, So you have to ask yourself, why is that? How can each one of be, these be perfect food for tomatoes when they're all different, right? And the reason for this is that none of them are tomato fertilizer. There is no such thing as tomato fertilizer. <laughs> and, and I have a hard time getting people to believe me. So I, I, I'll tell you another little story. So you and I both wanna to grow tomatoes. Right? You go out and you get your soil tested and you find out that you need potassium. Right? I go out and get my soil tested and I find I got lots of potassium, but I need phosphate. We both want to grow the exact same kinds of tomatoes. Would you and I use the same fertilizer? No. No. Because you need to add potassium and I need to buy, add phosphate. So when we fertilize, what we're really doing is we're replacing the missing nutrients in the soil and has nothing to do with the plants we're growing, okay? Right. Now, one of the reasons why people have a hard time understanding is that if you're in agriculture and you're growing 100 acres of tomatoes, you do go get your soil tested and you do order specific fertilizer for your soil. It's not 
tomato fertilizer, they actually formulate it for your particular property. Right. right? Um, but we do know that tomatoes grow best with certain levels of nutrients. And the lab will tell you for tomatoes, you need a little more potassium, a little less phosphate, a little more nitrogen, and so on. And now as a, gar as a farmer, I can fine tune my soil. Right? Right. Gardeners don't do that. We, we don't have the soil tested. We don't actually know what to add. But the main reason that I'm against these fertilizers is that, and why I'm against feeding plants is we don't feed plants. We feed the soil. We replace the nutrients that are missing in the soil. So I have a, a large garden, a six acre garden. I throw, throw, grow 3000 different plants. They all grow in the same soil. Okay, I don't go around trying to make fertilizer for each of these different plants. <laughs> yes. Trees, shrubs, deciduous, evergreens, perennials, they all grow in the same soil, right? Because it's the nutrients in the soil that are important. We, we don't feed plants, okay? Um, and I think if people get away from that idea of feeding plants, then they'll understand how fertilizers work much better. Yes, you know? yes. Uh, I, even for house plants, that that's true. And um, you know, we have aquam violet fertilizer, we have orchid fertilizer, we have some other things. All house plants, as far as I can tell, take about the same nutrients. And the NPK ratio is a three one two. Okay, sometimes for some they like a three one three, but essentially the same. So a three one two. If your fertilizer is in that range for house plants and container plants. They work for everything, mm. right? There's no such thing as orchid fertilizer, except in the minds of marketing people and some gardeners, <laughs> yes. right? And they go out and they buy, try to buy a fertilizer for each type of plant they grow. Okay? Yeah. It's yeah, all it is, is marketing. Amazes me how much the gardening world and the fishing world are similar. You know, they sell the lure to the fishermen, the fish, you know, usually a hook and a worms good enough for most fish. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, in terms of minerals, um, so I mean, we often talk, I mean, uh, I don't know where a, a mineral stop and chemicals begin or in, in, in any way, but in terms of minerals, I mean, how important are they? And, you know, do we need to add things like rock dust to ensure uh, the right amount of soil? Like why are people so so interested in in mineral content i've never really given it a second thought and it seems to be fine but why would one care why do one care well because the marketing people are making you care okay. that's why <laughs> so so minerals are really the same nutrients that we've been talking about except they usually refer more to things like calcium magnesium iron all of those things are both minerals and they're plant nutrients. So they, they revolve about uh, on all of those things. Right. So here's an idea. We've been growing things in our fields for a hundred years in North America, right? And we keep harvesting out. So we must be reducing the number of minerals in the soil. I, I, that's, that's obvious, right? Well, it isn't actually so obvious. And I, I actually wrote an article about this because I believed it and I went to do some research on it and I, I was quite surprised at what I was reading. It turns out that the amount of minerals that are actually taken out of soil by our crops is, is very, very small. Right? right. And so I did some calculation about how much potassium a carrot takes out or something and we can grow a thousand years of carrots on our soil and not run out of potassium right so this idea that our soils are being depleted in minerals because we're harvesting them doesn't seem to be true now there have been some studies done that tested uh, the minerals now compared to 100 years ago in various vegetables and so on but there's some there's some tricky things about doing that. Um, it turns out our food today is just as nutritious as it was 100 years ago. Okay, Although a lot of people don't believe that. They think oh, no. that our, our carrots are less nutritious today than they were in the past. And the reason is we don't have enough minerals in our soil. Right. That's a very common mantra. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. But it's not true. 
Um, it, and it's it's a complicated topic, but there doesn't seem to be any good evidence that our carrots today are any different than before. One of the issues is that we're growing completely different carrots than we did back then, different cultivars, right? And so they're right. going to have different nutrient values and so on. Right. The other big difference is that our testing is much better now than it was 100 years ago. So we're right. testing different things, right? We're using different test procedures to measure these things. And so we necessarily can't compare those. Anyways, it's, as far as I can tell, the fruit today is just as nutritious as it ever has been. What? Yeah. And we have larger amounts of it, which is the other key thing, right? Well, it also we, would it also would beg the question, like if if they're depleted, like if you or I were depleted in minerals, we would look bad. Yeah. <laughs> we would not look healthy. Uh, any one thing, we're depleted in any of the one, any of the I don't know sixty things that we need or whatever. Um, we we would we would have a disease. We would be unwell. Um, so you got nice, healthy looking carrots. They how depleted can they be? If they were depleted, they, they wouldn't, you know, just, they would be very, uh, they wouldn't get size, they wouldn't get yield, they, you know, would be disease prone, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah. well, for instance, if, if there's not enough iron in the soil, the, the leaves won't grow right and you won't have carrots, right? Or calcium. Thank you, little things, right? Yeah. Um, so, it, from, based on everything I can tell, uh, our food is just as nutritious and our soils are not being depleted of minerals. So now we come back to this business of, of rock dust and, and other ways of putting these minerals back. If you believe that our soils are being depleted, then we should be putting those minerals back. And rock dust is one way, apparently, that does this, right? The rock dust certainly has minerals in it. Uh, all the minerals in our soil originally came from rocks. And over millions of years, they get degraded and the minerals get released and so the plants can use them. So putting these rocks back works. And, and this is a big industry, rock dust. And uh, I even went to a trade show and they were, they were selling rock dust. And it was actually a Canadian brand of rock dust. So I went up and asked the guy, he says, um, have you ever tested a field one year, put on rock dust and tested it next year to see if you actually increase the number of minerals. He had never thought of that before. <laughs> just, isn't this kind of an obvious thing? You're, you're trying to sell me on putting rock dust on this ground. <laughs> um, I think the only thing being tested is the spreadsheets of uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, cost to uh, sales ratios. <laughs> so I've looked everywhere for a test that will show me that the numbers are lower before we add the rock dust and higher after, right? I can't find it. Nobody seems to want to do that test. The other test that's critical is how quickly does this rock dust turn into minerals that plants can use? Right. And the best I have is some estimates in, in some scientific journals that say maybe in a hundred years, some of these minerals will be released, okay? Rock dust is still small pieces of stone. They're not minerals. They look small to us, but on a molecular basis, they're huge, huge stones compared to what a phosphate molecule looks like, right? And it, I cannot find anyone that says, well, this rock dust will turn into phosphates and potassium anytime soon except in cases where the soil pH is quite low and we're talking below 5.5, mm -hmm. okay? So in very acidic conditions, these rocks do degrade more quickly. Right. And so in that kind of soil, perhaps they work. Um, I can't find any evidence that putting it in a normal soil, which is a pH, you know, six to seven, 7.5 in that range is gonna make any difference whatsoever. Right. And if any readers disagree with me, show me the study because I'd love yes. to see it. Well, I'm sure there's people that put rock dust down in their garden and they have a good year and they say that was the rock dust, right? Of course. Um, I'm inclined to think like, like if I put some, some leaves on my garden, right? That, that tree took a whole bunch of minerals out of the ground to make its leaves. And now the leaves are, I, I imagine whatever minerals are in those leaves are, are more available to a to a given plant eventually 
um, more quickly available than would be whatever minerals are in rock particles. Um, I also think, I mean, you know, if you're outdoors and you leave something outside uh, in the wind, it gets, you know, there's like, there's particles of stuff flying around in the air all the time, dust and all these sorts of things. There's, there's gotta be some amount of, of stuff accumulating on your soil, just falling out of the sky, you know, just space dust and you know, whatever's moving around as well. Um, I don't know, I don't know how much, right? But uh, actually yeah. one problem that is a very real problem is the loss of topsoil, right? Loss we of top talk soil. about this top three, six inches, depending on where you are. That, that's the most valuable soil we have. And wind erosion is a big issue. And mm -hmm. I, it's much bigger than I think gardeners appreciate. And so our, our good soil is constantly being blown away. And uh, I always made the comment, well, it's got to blow somewhere else, right? It's going if to my mine, garden. Mine, mine blows east, they'll end up in your garden. So you, <laughs> but I, I guess eventually a lot of this does end up in oceans and rivers and so on, or, or in areas that we, we don't farm or, or we don't use the soil. And right. so it is being lost, constantly lost. And so it is important to protect that top layer. There's another reason why rototilling is so bad because it just makes that that problem worse. And then, yeah, and another good but, reason to mulch. And a good reason to mulch, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in, in agriculture, mulching is a little hard, but certainly in our backyards, it's, it's not. Absolutely. Right? Um, so another question I had is like, let's, let's say you, you do the tidy whitey test and you fail it. You know, six weeks go by and they're pretty much intact or mostly intact. Um, how can gardeners uh, increase the micro population as well? What can they do to, to rectify that? Because it's, that's the, you know, you, you probably want to turn that around fairly quickly. How do you go about doing that? Uh, you don't, <laughs> this is not something you can do quickly. Right. All right. Building soil is a slow process. So if someone thinks that, you know, they're going to start gardening next summer and they're going to do something and by next year they got this great soil, that, that's probably not true unless they went out and bought it. <laughs> right. So improving soil and growing microbes is a slow process. And the secret is to get organic matter into the soil. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of the things we've been talking about are composting. Uh, by the way, the book I've just started writing is on composting. So, mm. uh, but composting, getting that material into your garden instead of to the landfill. Um, those leaves that are falling right now, you want to keep them on your property. Okay. I, it, it just hurts me to see all the leaves being right to the curb for someone to pick up, to take away. <laughs> okay? Those things should be on your property. Yeah. Um, getting those into the soil somehow, any kind of organic matter and whatever you can get is the best. So manures, um, uh, mushroom compost, your own compost, whatever you can get, even if you have to go and buy compost, uh, you want to add some to your soil every year. Mm -hmm. Now you can have too much compost and okay? too much compost in the soil gets too rich and that causes plants not to grow so well. It actually becomes toxic to them. Mm. But an inch or two on your soil every year is not going to be too much. So it's a yearly thing. Keep putting it in. Um, you know, when I'm deadheading plants, that stuff goes into the garden. I'm always mulching. So that mulch that I bring into my property is a little bit of organic matter. It's slowly decomposing. You know, every year I bring in a few straw bales and two years from now they're kind of gone they're in that soil so I, I keep bringing those in every year um keep adding that to the soil right? right and then the flip side of that is do things that microbes like okay uh no compaction no tilling both of those harm microbes uh keep soil water and this is one i i never gave much thought to because i i'm not a big believer in, in using a lot of water, but microbes stop growing if it gets too dry. Okay? Your plants are harmed too if they get too dry, but the microbes go first. So you want to keep a reasonable amount of moisture in that soil. Mm. 
Um, they don't want to be wet. They don't want it soggy. So you can overwater too, but don't let your soils dry out too much in the summertime. Uh, and their food is organic matter. So just keep throwing in the organic matter. Okay. Well, what about, um, you know, a lot of viewers will say that they've bought, um, you know, inoculants and these sorts of things to, you know, inject life into their soil. What What yeah. is your advice with those sorts of products? Yeah, I, in fact, I just, the last couple of days, I've spent a lot of time on Bakashi web uh, group, uh, Facebook groups. And oh, everyone's boy. talking about all these microbes. We're, we keep adding these microbes to the soil and it's the biology is getting so good. So here's a fundamental concept that I think people don't understand. The soil, whatever it is, crappy, great, fantastic, doesn't matter, holds a certain amount of microbes. Okay? It's kind of like a, a football stadium, right? The football stadium holds 40,000 people. That's all it holds. Okay? If another 10,000 show up and want seats, they don't get seats because there's no space for them. And the soil works the same way. You cannot throw in a bunch of microbes and think they're gonna make a difference. Whatever our soil is, it's saturated with microbes, okay? When it gets cool, like this time of year, they start dying off and we get less of them. Next spring, as the soil warms up, they multiply and we get more and more of them, okay? We add some organic matter, we get more and more of them, but it's always saturated. And they grow so quickly that they saturate very quickly. Mm -hmm. Throwing some extra in makes no difference. Now I've looked at, I've looked at Bokashi, I've looked at uh, compost tea is another one. They make big claims about all these microbes I'm putting in the soil. I have yet to find a single study that shows those microbes do anything in the soil, um, except in some very specific diseases. And there are a few diseases where some studies have shown some positive results. Right. But as far as increasing the, num the number of microbes in your soil, as far as increasing the quality of your soil, they don't do anything because they're going to be outcompeted with what's there. Right. And the number of microbes in soil is so huge. Okay, like a little speck of soil in the palm of your hand can have a billion bacteria in there. Okay. The amount in jars is pretty small relative to the soil you, you've got to saturate. Um, so I think that whole concept of adding microbes to the soil is completely wrong. Um, some people say, well, I've, I've got really crappy soil. I moved into a new home and the builders came in and they took all the topsoil away and they compacted everything. My soil is terrible. Wouldn't it help in that situation? No, because you put them on there, they just die. Okay. If the soil is suitable for them to live in, they would already be there. Right? They're floating all over the place. They're, every time you take a breath, you suck in microbes. They're <laughs> everywhere. So right. if you have good soil, they will find it. You don't have to buy it. Right. So the, 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 better, the better practice is to do the things that, that create the environment where they want to live. They want to multiply. They will proliferate. They'll be happy. Yeah. 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 They're there already. We, you just have to increase the numbers. Right. Yeah. And the numbers will not increase if you're not providing the inputs that allow them to proliferate. Right. Right. And then, and, and the, and not just the inputs, but the, the environment, maintain, like, maintaining the environment that they prefer. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Lots of sense. air, lots of the moisture and lots of food. Right. That's, what just, that's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if you think about it, particularly bacteria, they're not a lot different than us. They no. sort of eat the same things almost. Except we can eat a whole carrot and they can only eat the molecules off a carrot. But yes. their metabolism in many ways is similar. They, they breathe in oxygen and give off CO2. Um, as they metabolize, they give off heat. <laughs> Um, they fight each other. There's wars between them. Um, you know, they move around. Um, they're not that different. Not that different. And I've met some people that remind me of bacteria. Uh, <laughs> and some of them are even smarter than some people I know. <laughs> and that's very possible. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, you know, we could go. Uh, there really is like, I don't even think we got to the end of the book uh, here. And there's a lot more in this book. If you haven't read it, 
uh, check it out. Like I said, I could have done, I could have done a, a one plus hour podcast on every chapter of this book. Um, and I think that would have been the only proper way to treat it. But then um, the whole season would have been devoted to that, which still wouldn't have been a waste of time. That would have been good. But, uh, you know, we try to we try to have a variety. So at least we, we did a, a good deep dive into soil with Robert this year. And, uh, and thanks for so, uh, so much for coming on to talk about it. Um, this book you're doing you. on uh, compost, when's that uh, sort of? Uh... Oh, well, my next book is actually going to be called uh, Plant Science for Gardeners. Okay. Uh, which is sort of a, a botany science uh, book. Okay. But it's directed towards gardeners. Right. So, and that should be out in four months, maybe five months. Oh, well, like okay. That. So next spring ish. Yeah, something uh, like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's good. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of control over it once no. I've submitted it, right? But yes. uh, yeah, late well, spring. You're incredibly prolific. So uh, I, I can't wait to read it and I can't wait to talk to you about it. <laughs> Great. Um, Robert, thanks so much for coming on the show again and uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. It was great. Have a nice winter inside. <laughs> okay. Everybody out there, I hope you enjoyed this uh, podcast. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks, Hi, <everyone>. Robert. <laughs> Hey folks, if you want to help support my podcast and my YouTube channel, check out my sponsors, Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Uh, for Vessi's, go to their website, Vessi's.com, use my coupon code GAVS21, and you'll get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in your order and you don't have an oversized item uh, in your order. Just check out the description. The, de the details are in the description box of this video. Uh, if you want to buy stuff from uh, Safer's Gardening Products, you can buy all the things I use from Vessi Seeds and you'll get free shipping that way. They, they, they sell BTK, uh, Slug and Snail Killer, and the end all that I use. Just check out the tools and accessories uh, link on their website. Uh, but you can also, if you're in Canada, you, you can buy uh, Safer's Gardening Products from woodstreambrands.ca. Um, if you have an order over $69, you'll get free shipping on that. They got a wide range of products goes well beyond the three things I use. I just, I only buy things for the problems I have, right? So I don't, but they've got all kinds of, pro, uh, you know, products for beetles and things like that. If you're in the U.S., go to saferbrand.com and buy your stuff there. That's the U.S., you know, if you're in U.S., buy from that uh, website, order online. They offer free shipping on all orders over $45. I assume that's $45 U.S., so yeah. If you want to help support the channel and the podcast, they sell something you need, buy it from them. That'll help support everything I'm doing here. Thanks a lot.